Uh, so our next uh, session is with Jeff Waddle. Um, uh, Jeff, like many people today, wears a huge number of hats um, and alongside his job at uh, NTS, he's also our BSBI Vice County Recorder. Um, so uh, he's coming at this from multiple angles. Uh, without further ado, I will hand over to you to talk about your expedition to West Africa. Okay, well, thanks, Sarah. So I'm, I'm assuming everyone can hear hear me and see the presentation. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll just kick on. So I'm also going to talk about the National Trust for Scotland site, but it's it's not quite as famous as Ben Law's, but, but even so, I think it does have a lot of botanical interest. And uh, myself, uh, Jim McIntosh, Matt Parrott and Dan Watson went there earlier this year to do some botany. Um, and, and this is part of a uh, recording that we do at National Trust for Scotland. And it was also great to have a couple of friends and colleagues along from the BSBI. So firstly, uh, may, maybe people don't know where the site is quite, quite so well as Ben Lors. It's in the West Highlands, the Northwest Highlands, and uh, uh, the National Trust for Scotland boundary, it, it's, it covers an area about the size of Edinburgh. So it's one of our largest sites. It, it's not as big as Mar Lodge, which is about four times the size of Edinburgh, but, but it's a uh, it's, it's our second biggest site. And it's also very remote. And I think that's one of the reasons it's not been looked at botanically so much, um, as well as obviously not being quite so appealing as Ben Lors. But the quickest way in is about a nine kilometre walk from uh, Loch Clooney uh, in the southeast there. And that would take you to well, the Youth Hostel, which is where we're staying. But we came in from the east. Uh, we had a lot of equipment in a vehicle, so we actually drove along a track from east. I'm not sure how far that is, but I'm guessing it's about 30 kilometres, something of that order. And it, it was quite an interesting trip, not only because it's such a, a remote area that's seldom visited with some amazing scenery and plants, but also because we were following in the footsteps of some previous botanists. Uh, uh, I, 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 close colleague and friend of mine in the BSBI, Rod Corner, led a party there in 1974 with three other botanists, and he published an account of that trip in Watsonia. So it was great to, to follow in Rod's and his team's footsteps, not only uh, following up records that these guys made in 1974, but also having a read of, of their expedition and comparing it with ours. So I think I'll start by the, the sort of ordeal of getting there. As I said, it is very remote. And I think in 1974, they had a bit of a harder time than we did. We, we actually drove to Afnamalik to the east and then walked in the last three and a half miles and they carried all of their gear, which, which I can't imagine how difficult that would have been. Um, on the way out, I think they got some help with the British Geological Survey who were there and had this bizarre off-road machine called a NAT, apparently, which looks like it would fail all health and safety requirements nowadays, but that managed to, to get all their kit in and out. And we also tried to use a golf caddy, apparently, and, and that proved a failure because of the peat bogs and stony ground. Um, we drove in, I don't think the video player works, unfortunately, on this laptop, but um, uh, we drove in and we had to carry our gear about five metres uh, up the path to the, the hostel, so we had a much easier time. But at one point, we did need to all get out of Land Rover uh, and do a bit of road track repair. We had to chuck some rocks into a rutted area or we would have got stuck. So the botanists that were there in 1974, it was apparently it was an expedition organised by the Committee for the Study of the Scottish Flora. And they were doing a quadrant map of uh, mainland Invernessshire. So that was mapping five kilometre squares. We also recorded, thankfully for us, a uh, 100 metre cell resolution of the rarer plants. So Rod Corner, he led that trip. Uh, and also he had Ron McBeath, John Wynnham and Dan Kingston uh, along with him. So the, the four of them done some tremendous work covering a massive area. I think they covered eight quadrants or five kilometre squares. And we had quite difficult weather, quite difficult conditions in terms of accommodation and transport. Um, so the botanist in 2021 was myself down in the bottom left there, Dan Watson, he's the 
he's our Alpine plant specialist at National Trust for Scotland. Obviously, Sarah's done a lot of work as well in the past few years. Uh, and we had Matt Parrott, the BSBI conifer referee, who's quite interested in Alpine plants as well. And Jim McIntosh, who, who always seems to be there on these trips, uh, holding, the, holding the recording card and taking all the records. We also had a special guest, uh, Matt's dog, Bracken. Uh, so that, that, that helped us a little bit. And, and the other thing to say was the weather was just absolutely incredible on our trip. In, in the top right photo there, every day we woke up to these amazing temperature inversions. So we started off in a bit of mist and fog and that burnt off within an hour, a couple of hours, because this was late July. And we happened to be there on exactly the same days in, in late July as Rod and his team were 47 years before us, coincidentally. But the top left photo, that's the top of Skur Nakirmanen. And uh, it, it was on the drive back, I remember it was 29 degrees in Fort William, and I don't think it was far off it up there either. And uh, although this is one of the highest Munro's in the area, it's just over 1,100 metres above sea level, we actually saw a Scotch Argus butterfly uh, hilltop in there. And that was the highest record ever in the UK by about 145 metres. I published a note on the previous high altitude records of that species in 2005 in Atropus. So it was great to, to see that butterfly at the top of the mountain. And we were looking there over to Carnay and Mamsol Ridge to, to east there, which is also a great place for alpine plants. Uh, and the evenings were beautiful. One of the benefits of being out here uh, and camping in these remote areas is you're up in the mountains in the evenings, you get you come back down when the sun's setting. And the view we could see across there, you're looking across the rum, we could even see across the canna, which is pretty remarkable. But in 1974, we had some terrible weather. Um, just a few quotes here from uh, the Watsonia article. So we had hail, rain, uh, and yeah, we, we were so lucky with the weather. And I think being in these places in good weather is, 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 is a special experience, but being there in poor weather is, can be quite dodgy and quite difficult, obviously. We also had some great accommodation. We were staying in Alt Youth Hostel. We had the place to ourselves which was great. We had gas, we had a, a log burner to heat up the water for a shower, we had a dormitory to ourselves. But in 1974, I think we were staying out the back in, in the, the more basic accommodation and had swamp-like conditions on the bunk room floor and I'd use a large boulder to, to jam the door shut to stop it from being blown open. So very different conditions. And they were also displaced by 17 German school children uh, people just turn up at these places in the middle of nowhere and you've got to let them in so they can have shelter and sleep for the night. There's no option to, to walk out often if you arrive late in the evening. So moving on to the plants, we also had a great time in terms of the plants we found. This is uh, Norwegian cudweed, Nephelium norvegicum. I think I've only seen that once before. I think Jim and Dan likewise, and I think it was Matt's first time. So it's, it's one of our rarer alpine plants. And it tends to grow in really dodgy places, in my experience. And Dan and Jim, you can see here, we're on quite a steep slope, which was a lot steeper in real life than it looks in the photo there. And if, if you imagine you are where Dan and Jim are looking up the slope, this is the sort of habitat you'd see. So it's quite a soft, fissile rock, which breaks down quite easily into a sandy soil. And in the middle of the photo, if you look closely, you can see these sort of glaucous, silvery stems of Norwegian cudweed. So that was a special find, and you can see the green dot we put on the map in the west there. And uh, Rod's party did find that in 1974. We found it on Skurna Kierman, and we found it in Corregedio to the east. Uh, we did look for their site, but we didn't find it. But it was great to discover a new site for this plant, which probably has about less than 30 sites in the UK currently. We also were very lucky to refind curved woodrush, Lusula arcuata. This wasn't found on Skur Nakirmanen by Rod's party. Uh, it was found to the east in, in a different 10 kilometer square, but the colony we found it hadn't been seen since 1946, just after World War II. So it, it's, it's really special when you find such a rare plant after such a long period of time. And you can see here, 
it grows in this sort of open fell field, stony habitat. And if we zoom in on that, you can see it's quite open with some big rocks. It's a bit like a rock garden. You've got things like Salix herbacea, least willow, Rachimetrium linuginosum, woolly fringe moss, but it's quite sparse vegetation. And again, it was great to put this red data book rare species back on the map. Uh, Updating a 1947 record, you can see Rod's re team's record was, was that red square to east there. Uh, we found it on Mam Sol, about, I don't know, 15 kilometres to east, uh, quite sparingly. But we found a large population. This, this is the west stop of Skur Nakirmanen in the left photo there, uh, taken from the west. And if you look closely at the peak, you can see um, uh, quartzite, that very white looking patch, which isn't snow, it's actually rock. We found it on both sides of that. We also found it coming down off the peak into that grassier vegetation. And so I guess we found maybe 300 odd plants. And another great thing was that on the top of West Stop and Skewer McKearmanen, there's three counties converge here, Eastern S, East Ross and West Ross. So we actually found it in all three vice counties. And then quite, quite a special one for me, we found two species which hadn't been recorded um, in that area before, on that hill or in, or in that range or, or on the NTS site. And those were alpine pearlwort and Scottish pearlwort, not, not the snow pearlwort that Sarah was talking about, but two closely related species in the same genus. And what, one of the things that struck me about it is the alpine pearlwort, pearlwort on the left there, it was grown in wetter conditions. There was, it, it's not that mat forming, so these are individual plants you're looking at, so there's gaps between the flowers. But the Scottish pearlwort on the right was grown in sort of higher, drier hummocks, well, not hummocks, but slightly raised areas. Didn't have its feet quite so wet, and it was forming these patches because one of the hybrid parents is Sagina procumbens, procumbent pearlwort. So I, both of these are nationally scarce species. They're not quite as rare as the previous two, but, but that, they were both new hectad records, which, which is, feels like a great achievement to, to find these. And you can see the the, the, the sort of dot to the northeast. That, that was a Mary McCallum Webster record uh, from 1972 on Skur Nalape, Glen Strafara. Um, so Rod, Rod's party didn't find these two species and uh, we were very localised. And uh, Scottish pearlwort has been recorded a bit more in area before, but not in that hectare, sort of six kilometres to east is the closest area in Corrie by Theo Luizo in 2004. So this is just to give you an idea of a habitat, Skur Nakirmanen from the uh, northeast there in the left photo. You can see that large buttress in the foreground that was basically tucked in behind that in the flush. And if you look on the right hand side photo, there's the sort of green area in the base of Upper Corrie where that's where the flush was for both of these species. And then finally, the last sort of really special plant we found in this area was small cowwheat, Melampyrum sylvaticum. And it's got more populations in this area than it has anywhere else in the UK. Um, it's just got a lot of good habitat for it. And it, it, if you're into NVC, it grows in quite a specific community here. It grows in U16, Lusula sylvatica, Greater Woodrush, Vixinia myrtleus, tall herb vegetation. And that's acid but humus rich soils on ledges out of the reach of grazing deer and sheep. Dan's on the left hand photo here and his hand's actually touching the plant. You can see where it's grown here on this U16 Lusula ledge. So this is a nationally scarce species and we added it in two adjacent hectares here. You can see in the green there in the, in the northwest. And this is Keith Du, one of the Munros in the area just to the southwest of LB Ufostal. Apologies, the slide on the right's a little bit faint, but hopefully you can see Keystu is in the sort of bottom left there or center left. You can see there's like three or four green dots we added. These are 100 meter cells. And likewise in Corrigadial to the northeast there, that, that's, that we found it there as well. That's where the photo was taken with Dan. And every single one of these was a place where Rod and his team had found it in 1974. So it just shows you when we're going out and doing these trips, we're doing this recording nowadays, we're really benefiting from the work that's been done by previous botanists. 
So thanks very much for listening. Uh, we, we had a great time on the trip and it's really nice to share it with you. Hope you enjoyed the talk. And what, one final thing to say is we, we do these expeditions maybe two or three a year. And if anyone's interested in coming along, give one of us a shout and, uh, and it'd be great to have you along for a future one. Obviously, you have to be quite healthy and, and quite willing to do uh, wild camping. Thanks very much. Fantastic, Jeff. Thank you so much. Jim, any questions? Uh, can I ask you, uh, Jeff, you are very interested um, in the grazing and the amount of tree regeneration in that area. What what, what can you say about uh, what, what you found in, in West yeah. Coast Africa? Yeah, well, National Trust for Scotland, we do we do deer monitoring on our on our estates, obviously, and uh, some places it's higher than we'd like. And, and West Africa is one of those. And uh, it, it is quite a complex situation because although it's a big estate, um, we do have herds of deer roaming across the boundary, obviously, and some of our neighbours don't share our ecological interests. They're, they're more uh, stocking deer for sport, which uh, which can be done in an ecological way. Uh, but, but a lot of the states run higher deer numbers to make stocking easier, basically, and so we can do more stocking days. But we, we are part of the deer management group here, and we, we do hold the, the chair for that deer management group and we are working with our neighbours rather than us just going ahead and up in the cull, that would probably be ineffective. We're trying to work with neighbouring estates to so that all the estates can reduce the cull. Uh, but, but having said that, it, it is a compromised situation where we can only move so far uh, at a given point in time. But, but the other thing to say is we've also worked with Trees for Life in, in the past uh, and Trees for Life have helped us install some exclosures uh, to plant native pinewood, uh, birch, and even some montane willow species. Brilliant, thank you. We're definitely getting some people who are interested in coming along with you on your next one. Might be, yeah. uh, <laughs> good. Might be a good group going out. Um, fantastic. And lots of people just saying uh, thank you and uh, for inspiring them to get up in the mountains, even if it's a, you know, a 9K walk in. Um, no excuse for not, <laughs> not getting your recording done. So that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah. So Ian Strachan is asking, what altitude is the Melampyrum sylvaticum, small yeah. cowpeat? And yeah. how does it seed into such dense vegetation, do you think? Well, I mean, we were generally not finding it at massively high altitude. I, I meant to say on that slide with Keith Stu, uh, there was a couple of gullies there, if you remember from the photo, and uh, we actually found it quite low down in those gullies. Um, and I, I'm guessing probably about 500, 600 metres. Um, and, and the colonies in the gullies were quite extensive. We did extend down it for 100 metres. The ones on the ledges were a bit more restricted because the sort of U16 on grazed ledges tended to be quite restric restricted patches. And what, what was the question about seeding? How does it seed into dense vegetation? Yes. Um, I mean, it is an annual, obviously, and U16, it's got quite a bryophyte layer. So it's a good question. It, it's got big, I think it's got quite big, heavy seeds, if, if I'm right. So I guess we'll help it penetrate and uh, I, I know it's got eliosomes on it, so ants might be involved in, in moving it around as well. Um, possibly the seeds are viable for a number of years, so that would allow it to sink through the vegetation mat eventually. I don't know that for sure, though. Yeah, that's great. Thank, thank you. Uh, I think that's uh, all the questions. Um, mm, thank so, you. A great talk. That, that was brilliant. Some, some great photographs. I really enjoyed the trip. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you both.